forum is on Mordich Jenner, which means strong feet. Um, it's a podiatry and diabetes education service for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people in the Perth metropolitan area. It's part of the National Close Blue Gap initiative and it's been developed with the primary aim of increasing access to dietary and diabetes services which are culturally secure for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. Mojit Jenna aims to help the community keep their feet healthy and strong, especially those that are at high risk of foot complications as a result of chronic disease. We're pleased to have Maureen Unsworth and Doreen Turvey presenting for you today, which are these lovely ladies here. So Maureen Unsworth, who is the first one here, she's a registered nurse, a midwife, and a credentialed diabetes educator, educator with a long history of working with the Aboriginal community. She's currently managing the Mordred Jenner program for the South Metropolitan Area Health Service. And behind Maureen is Doreen Turvey. She's an Aboriginal health officer, also working for the South Metropolitan Area Health Service. She's an Aboriginal health professional and diabetes educator, and she has a long history of working in health. If you can just welcome them, and they'll begin. Thank you, Juliana, um, for your kind presentation and for inviting us to, um, uh, to present uh, the Mudditch Jenner program. I'm Maureen, and this is Doreen. This is Maureen, this is Doreen. <laughs> we, we even share the same birthday, so we're quite often, we're quite often confused. Uh, yeah, so we're, we're two of the members of the, of the Mudditch Jenner uh, program. And as Juliana said, this is, this is a COAG uh, funded program, which means at the moment it's actually funded till July 2013. Uh, July 2013. Um, we are pretty sure that it will continue to be funded um, uh, post-2013, but we're not sure about that. It did actually start earlier than the COAG funding. It started in 2009 um, uh, when we were starting the District Aboriginal Health Action Groups uh, in the um, uh, South Metro Area Health Service where we were consulting with the community and um, podiatry and diabetes was um, a, a, um, a priority health issue identified by most of the District Aboriginal Health Action Groups. So it has actually been endorsed as a program that's a priority area from the community and that's where we wanted it to start. Um, when we look at why we actually need to actually have this service, as we would know, the, um, the burden of disease for, for Aboriginal people is much higher than non-Aboriginal Australians. In fact, it's listed as 2.5 times higher than, um, than other Australians. And in our South Metropolitan Area Health Service, we have 15,000 Aboriginal people. Uh, it's the second largest Aboriginal population in Western Australia next to the Kimberleys. Um, we have five health districts with the Armadale area having the highest um, uh, population of Aboriginal people. But even the smallest population of Serpentine, 400, um, 400 Aboriginal people, um, uh, we, we have um, significant population of of Aboriginal people living in our area. And we also know uh, it is improving um, and there's been a lot of, a lot of um, improvements in Aboriginal health in, in recent years, but in fact um, life expectancy is still 13 years um, less than um, the rest of Australians, mainly due to the burden of chronic disease um, like diabetes, heart disease, COPD, etc. And the diagnosis of diabetes occurs at a much younger age. We have um, Aboriginal people as young as, as 10 being diagnosed with type 2 diabetes under the care of PMH. Um, and they access services a lot less than the rest of the population. In fact, we know that they access mm -hmm. essential primary health services and secondary services 80% less than, than the rest of the population which is an indication that we do need to do things differently. The services are needed, but the services needed to be delivered in a way that was culturally appropriate for Aboriginal people. Um, diabetes is, um, uh, if you look at an Aboriginal person that's 40, um, uh, 25, oh, it's more than that, 45 percent of them will already be diagnosed with type 2 diabetes, whereas in our non-Aboriginal population, we start to screen for undiagnosed type 2 diabetes mm -hmm. at the age of 55. 
but for Aboriginal people we screen from the age of 18 because of the early onset of type 2 diabetes. We also know that the complications are um, uh, de uh, develop much earlier and um, quite often a person with diabetes will have up to five comorbidities as well as their diabetes. And in a Western Australian research um, published recently, um, Aboriginal people are 38 times more likely to have a below knee amputation uh, by the age of, of, of 49, which is really high. That is high, and also uh, overall with amputations, um, it's usually about 98% of Aboriginal people with amputations due to diabetes and its complications. Yeah, and, and that's that's a very high figure, you know, that, that's scary. And I guess that's why um, we really need this program. Yeah. And when it comes to why do Aboriginal people not engage with um, uh, our mainstream health services, it's for many, many reasons. But for a lot of it, it's because they've actually had um, a, a um, traumatic experience um, with mainstream services uh, but there are other reasons like transport and, um, and some of the other barriers that, that um, stop people from um, self-managing or looking after themselves or looking after their conditions. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Whereas where the um, podiatrists are, I don't know if Angela, what about podiatrists who may be listening, um, whether she wants to come online but to add to what we're saying, as part of our team we've got to Podiatrists, mm. and um, yeah, we really work work in well together as a team. Because we're only a small team, but it really does work. And I'll go on to explain after about <coughs> the assessments and yeah. yeah. Okay. And when this proposal was put up to the Aboriginal community as part of one of the COAC funded funded programs, it was actually titled a different name. It was titled um, Podiatry and Nutrition Outreach Services. And from the very beginning, the community actually, um, even though nutrition is important, we all know that, um, they actually identified um, diabetes as their most serious health issue, which is why we changed the staffing configuration to podiatry and diabetes ed. Um, and we actually refer to um, uh, um, other uh, health disciplines like the dietitians, social workers, physiotherapists, um, um, occupational health thera uh, uh, occupational therapists in mainstream services. So we're not about actually duplicating any services. We're about also improving people's access to service. But when and working in partnership. Yeah. And working in partnership. Yeah. So our our initial focus was to really um, identify high risk foot problems um, and amputations because a lot. Um, a lot of people actually remain undiagnosed with quite serious complications in the community. We also wanted to improve Aboriginal people's access to routine podiatry care. We know that everyone with a high-risk foot problem um, uh, or, or diabetes should be screened uh, on an annual basis and in some areas with the Aboriginal community they say every six months because things go wrong fairly quickly um, for some Aboriginal mm. people. So we wanted regular screening and none of our clients are actually discharged. They're on a, on a system where we can actually flag them to come back for their regular six month screening um, uh, to ensure that things, things don't happen it, um, uh, that is um, not, are going to d decrease their, their well, health status. Yeah. That, that's right. Um, there's no three strikes and you're out, you know, three DNAs and you're out. We, yeah, we just hang on to the clients and, and do reviews, follow up with reviews. And we're very lucky that we actually have, uh, most of our staff are Aboriginal and um, uh, Doreen is our most senior Aboriginal health professional who actually has the diabetes education qualification but we've also got Susie Bonney um, and Michelle Michael and um, they, they, are, they know their community, they know their networks and they know uh, the, their families. So it, 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 we, we actually can follow up Aboriginal people um, through the Aboriginal networks that tend to be in, in mainstream actually fall through through the crack quite often. 
But we also want to actually make sure that we put in diabetes education and management of foot problems and strategies to ensure that we prevent um, amputations. Where possible, we, re we, we work in partnership with organisations like multidisciplinary wound clinics, Silver Chain, um, Wounds West, um, other specialty services, and we don't want to duplicate the gap, but we also want to actually influence uh, mainstream services so that they actually start to uh, provide these services a little bit more culturally appropriate for Aboriginal people. It's not about changing the content of what they, um, what services they provide, it's about changing the process and how they actually address and develop rapport and um, the, win back the trust that's been lost um, by Aboriginal people with our mainstream health services. So what we're really about is closing the gap not duplicating any services. So we actually aim, as our, our first priority, top one off the list, is to make sure that our, our service is culturally appropriate. So even when it came to recruiting our staff, we actually had um, Aboriginal elders who were trained in HR process to sit on the panel uh, and be part of the selection process for our staff. Wherever possible, we actually employed Aboriginal people with the qualifications um, because that's the most culturally appropriate way um, to have our workforce that is actually one of the community um, to actually ensure that Aboriginal people um, trust and develop a rapport and the service is respectful and appropriate. And that was really good because it really worked having an Aboriginal community member come in and sit on the panel and they're likely to pick the right person for that job or they think, you know, who, who would be able to, uh, I guess, um, work in with, engage with the community, work in with them and, yeah, uh, that was really good, mm. um, just being able to put that in place. Uh, our service delivery model um, is quite different um, and that was at the request of the Aboriginal community uh, access was a, a main criteria for how the service was to actually be. Um, what's that? You're going to stop. I think you might have. Yes, I'll press something. Just keep going. Yeah. Yeah, how, how the service was to actually be uh, delivered. Um, so, in the first instance, um, uh, we, because we, we're, we're, we're a duplicate of, of the service in North Metro Area Health Service too. So a North Metro Area Health Service and South Metro Area Health Service have their own teams uh, and their own podiatry vans and their own bases, but wherever possible we work together uh, and there is a steering committee to guide that with Aboriginal health professionals on that steering committee. Because we want to actually make sure that the population across the metropolitan area, which is Virtually the same needs are for North Metro Area Health Service and South Metro Area Health Service um, is duplicated and we work together to make sure the service is actually, um, we're learning from one another as well, from the experiences that they've, they've actually uh, come across in the North. Um, uh, sometimes we learn from that and likewise with the South team when we share with our experience from the South, they actually um, learn from us and we share resources and that's actually reduced the cost of developing the services by having not, not duplicating anything. Even our promotional pamphlet is the same. But our podiatry service actually goes out and you'll see the map shortly to 10 sites now. Six of those are from a podiatry van that's been purposely fit, uh, fitted out as a podiatry clinic where we couldn't partner up with an existing service um, and the others are are partners with, with Aboriginal um, organisations that already provide services for Aboriginal people in that we wanted to, one of the wishes of right at the initial consultation was a one-stop shop. Aboriginal people wanted to come to one place for all their services. So we've actually, even though in some areas we have, um, uh, in the, from the COAG funding, have actually implemented purposely um, uh, built or acquired um, one-stop shops for Aboriginal community where all health services are run, like the Woodwich Court in Quinana and the Nijinawanga Maya down in, 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 in Mandurah. And they are two of the partners that we go once a week 
and add to their, their service. So when we've partnered with an existing organisation in a local area, we actually want to, want to actually link with existing networks there so that when we're not there, the service continuity can continue. So the service delivery model is quite hard in that we operate from one base in Kelmscott and we have to travel to our clinics every day and with our equipment as well because the, the, our partners actually don't have space in their services for our, our equipment so we pack our, uh, our, van, our cars up and our vans up and travel to site and have the clinic from 10 to 3 and then pack up and come home and sterilise our equipment and do our data entry and um, uh, catch up on our, our case management and follow up phone calls etc. So it is quite um, uh, 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 intensive for our staff um, and the travel is quite extensive. Initially um, we thought we'd be um, uh, perhaps focusing more on identifying and uh, early, an early intervention for uh, high-risk foot problems but as it is um, just from last year's um, number of people who registered in our program which was 318 118 of those actually were categorised as high risk that already had wounds, that already had infections, that already had amputations, that already had severe compromised neuropathy and devascularised legs and other complications from diabetes as well. On dialysis um, and a lot of our, our case coordination is actually supporting our our clients to access other levels of care that they need to for um, the uh, essential services that they're missing out on. Diabetes self-management education was a really important area for Doreen to work on but what we're finding is that she's really having to concentrate on diabetes management in the first instance yeah. Yeah. And, and so many of them have uncontrolled yeah. diabetes or on wacky treatment regimes that need to be worked out. So. Uh, first thing is to do a uh, diabetes assessment and it, it's a really good comprehensive assessment which um, uh, just to be able to for people to manage um, their diabetes uh, you've got to work through the um, barriers first um, uh, just I guess working with people and supporting people and, and teaching people how to self-manage and trying to uh, uh, get help or support for any issues that are stopping people from managing. Um, that's where our um, we've, we've got a comprehensive um, assessment tool that we use. Uh, ab our Aboriginal uh, health professional Susie or myself will do the initial assessment and where that initial assessment is concerned is where all the areas, um, the social health um, things are usually identified which is really good so when we first see a client it, it, that initial assessment you know is vital because yeah we can't teach people how to self-manage when everything else is going on and then they'll have the um, diabetes assessment and you do the biometrics as well and then podiatry assessment so yeah it really is a comprehensive um, really quality service that we're providing um, out in the community, and um, I guess we've hit the ha uh, hit hit the road running. You know, like Maureen said, we're flat out doing clinics from Tuesday to Thursday. We're at different clinics all the time. We actually go to nine clinics, or myself as well, uh, a fortnight. So we're flat Are we? out. Are we? Sorry. Nine clinics. Oh no, nine clinics. Yeah, it's like with um, the Kelmscott, that's our Monday clinic, so we're, we're at our base. The rest are off-site, so yeah, flat out, like Maureen said, loading our equipment, making sure we're organised and we haven't forgotten anything. And because it's a new service, we've, we've learnt a lot on the way too. Um, like anything new, you know, what works, what don't work, and, and developing um, our... Um, whether it's our paperwork, yeah, just changing it as needed to fit in, to fit in how to work Aboriginal way, and and that's really important. You know, that the first thing of all before you even do the assessment, you know, greeting people warmly and trying to build up that rapport and yeah, 
offering a cuppa and, and also the resources are really important too. Um, having a, a culturally appropriate um, resources and posters up and making people feel, you know, making the environment welcoming as well and that's really helped. And also, you know, with the partnerships um, at the different um, clinics, whether they're um, on site or through the mobile band, it's been really good having those yep. partnerships. Yep. And one of the important areas that we've actually worked on is, um, uh, is community awareness. Um, now, our, our biggest um, tool for promoting uh, is our van and our uniforms and our community network. Um, we actually have got uniforms and the community actually recognise um, the Woodwich Jenner team uh, out and about. Um, the van's been painted um, by an Aboriginal artist and that was a community uh, consultation process as well where we went to the community and ran an art competition in South Metro Area Health Service and the community voted which piece of art they wanted on the, on the program. And the name was actually also um, a, a community um, event where we actually, a competition, where we actually had ho um, ideas from the community of what they wanted to name the program because we wanted the service to be owned by the community right from the beginning. So they see it as their bus and, right, and on it it is, it is our um, podiatry and diabetes service and quite often we're asked um, put to the test of really actually extending ourselves to attend community events. Um, just this year we've attended nine community events um, uh, of significant dates for Aboriginal um, family uh, to support their community events uh, uh, because it is their van. Um, Susie has actually um, uh, been out to communities and promoted the service, <coughs> um, dropped flyers off, um, Every opportunity we have, we've had good news stories, which you'll see some photos, photos of shortly, um, where uh, good news stories have been published in the local newspapers. We've been um, offered by different um, organisations to publish articles in, in their local newsletters. We've done mail-outs through Babinga Maya to all of the Aboriginal communities in the areas. So there's been quite a lot of innovative strategies um, to promote the service to, to the Aboriginal community. But I would say the most solid um, and deadly way of promoting the service is by good news stories and by making sure that we follow through and provide the service the way the community want. And just recently when I was talking to an Aboriginal man attending, I asked him, so how did you find out about the service? And he said, oh, the word's out there more and we all know what's out there. You know, so you own, if, if you actually, uh, that's voting with your feet, so if you actually do get the response where the actual community are coming because they trust you and, they, and members of their family have a good experience, that's a solid way of actually promoting your service. The partnerships we've developed um, are all with service organisations that already provide services to Aboriginal people. Some of them are mem in memorandums memorandums of understanding where there's dual responsibility and in other areas there is a, an agreement between a community organisation like Babinga Maya and us that we actually add to their service. So partnerships have been a really important part of the program because we needed to link with the local um, community um, and that's been, that's had its challenges as well yeah. uh, in that when, when our, our staff have to work according to the work ethic of the organisation we're partnering with. So our, our staff, if they're in, in Woodwich Court, work under their work ethic. If we're at, at Wangan Murden, we work in their ethic. So it's actually quite challenging for our staff to actually um, have to meet all the demands of our partners to make sure that we're providing the service they, the way they want it delivered through their organisation. That's right, because you you've got an MOU at each each site that you go, so you know you've got that partnership there already, and um, some of the partnerships are with Durban European Health Service. Um, we go to the Maddington um, Clinic there. Um, does the North Metro go to Mirabuka? I yeah. assume, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And then we've got like GP practices where Canning Division of General Practice. Um, well, they've got Wangan Murden, so we've linked in with their Aboriginal Private yeah, Health Care team there. Yeah. And GP down south, it's with the Nijilawanga Maya. Yeah. 
and with the Rockingham Quinana Division, it's with Moodish Court. Um, uh, so the primary health care services and the GP practices, because they provide our clinical governance, is uh, important partners for us as well. Yeah. Also, uh, need to mention um, Woodia as well in Hamilton Hill, oh, which yeah. comes under. Yeah. Um, it's a, it's, it's a, uh, an NGO, but the Budia. So, so the, the, the non-government organisations like the Otis Centre, uh, Babinga Maya, um, Budia, um, are all supported through non-government organisation funding. That's right. So it's not always just government, it's non-government as well and local yeah. communities or local governments. Yeah. Yeah. And wherever possible, we've actually built on uh, the Aboriginal workforce. Um, uh, our Administrative Secretary is an Aboriginal woman. Doreen has recently got her qualification as a diabetes um, in as a, as a diabetes educator, has completed a graduate certificate. Our other health professional is now Aboriginal health professional is now doing her graduate certificate in diabetes education at Curtin. So we'll have um, to. So we'll we'll try and actually build, and we'd love to actually have a podiatry, an Aboriginal podiatrist too, um, if we could actually build that workforce. Um, so we are actually really focusing on. We need to increase the Aboriginal workforce if we're interested in improving the health of Aboriginal people. So in 2010, when we started, when we got the funding, um, the steering committee was formed um, to guide the um, uh, development of the team. Um, we, we didn't, as well as consult with the community, we also mapped uh, where Aboriginal people lived in South Victoria Health Service, where the populations lived, etc., so that we could be sure that we were going to locate at a place that was most suitable for the Aboriginal people. We also wanted to map what other services were being provided um, in, the, in the local districts so that we could link into the local networks and not duplicate any service but add value to what's existing. The community consultation I've already um, alluded to where we actually had um, right, to be, right at the beginning, what do you want the service to look like? Um, what's the name of the service? What would you like to name the service? Um, what artwork would you like? Um, and every quarter we have to report back to the community on our progress. Uh, they want us to be totally accountable and transparent with how we're operating. And in the new services that we're developing, we'll always go to the community first and ask, where do you think it would be best to actually um, uh, have the clinic in your area? Um, because we want it to be driven from community up um, uh, as, as well as during community support down as well. Yeah, that's, that's where I think it's working because um, uh, it was the community, it was Aboriginal um, people, representatives from all the districts um, that, um, I guess, told us what, what their needs were. We, you know, we didn't tell them, it wasn't top down, it was actually from the bottom up and that's why I think it's really, really working. Um, you know, they told us, you know, we need this, you know, too many Aboriginal people um, are dying from diabetes, too many people uh, uh, have amputations, um, uh, renal, you know, and heart disease, their families, you know, that was their concern and that's, that's why it was taken from, you know, the ground up and I guess, yeah, yeah. Uh, co-aid funding applied for. Yeah. So we not only got co-aid to report to, we've got our community yeah. to report to as well. Yeah, which is good. Yeah. And because we're actually recovering the whole of South Metro Area Health Service, we had to develop partnerships um, because we, we also wanted to honour the community's request for one-stop shops. Um, so part, the partnership model was actually the closest we could get to developing one-stop shops and just by adding um, um, those services. The service delivery model, it is an outreach service and there are some fixed clinics and there are some um, mobile clinics uh, and our team are split in two. Uh, like we run two clinics at a time. One is run from the van uh, with, um, either An with either Deirdre or Angela, uh, our podiatrist, and either Doreen or, or Susie as the other, other health professional. Um, so it's quite a sort of busy um, service delivery model because of the way we're actually running two clinics a day, yeah. except for Mondays and Fridays. Yeah. Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, it's double clinics across South yeah. Metro. Can I just add to that, yeah. Maureen? Um, yeah, because we've got two podiatrists, but there's only one diabetes educator and one Aboriginal health professional, so it's myself, 
and a podiatrist doing you know one clinic and then Susie our Aboriginal health professional and a podiatrist doing another clinic so you know we're flat out every day doing these clinics and that's why they amount to so many clinics and whatnot and with Susie she'll do the initial assessment but she does also does a lot of uh, care coordination and, and you know that takes a lot of time as well and um, like Maureen said um, yeah um, working in with, with others some of our partners and um, she also uh, one of the tools I really need to mention is because uh, I feel it really works well because um, you do the initial assessment, but when, when the barriers start coming out, why people can't self-manage is because of the, you know, all these barriers. So Susie actually does a Flinders assessment, but with this Flinders assessment, we use the, um, an adapted version of the Picawea tools, which is the Aboriginal um, medical service over in South Australia that was adapted from the Flinders. Uh, partners in Health and um, Q and Response, so we've adapted them to use as well and they really work well where you look at your whole lifestyle, you know, so many things going on, that's why you can't manage and that really does work be because you can't get to self-management, you know, it's, it's not even any good talking about self-management if um, everything else is going on, so yeah, there's a lot of, I guess, teamwork with podiatry as well we're referring to each other and all working as a team to make sure, you know, we follow, I guess, the best possible care and it's client-centred care for, for everyone. Yeah. <coughs> Although podiatry and diabetes is a health issue that we're being funded for, um, because we work in a holistic um, uh, model, every other health issue that is identified through these Flinders assessments and through the initial assessments are followed through by Susie. So it may be sort of a referral to the Mead Centre for mental health issues, helping them to um, uh, uh, um, get to SARC, you know, for domestic violence. Um, um, there is housing, transport, all of these things actually are addressed by it. Even someone who actually needs an ACAT assessment will actually be implemented from our, our area. Um, because a lot of Aboriginal people don't realise what they're entitled to. Uh, there was one particular man who missed out big time in one of our areas and initially when I followed up with um, the ACAT um, assessment team, he dropped off their agenda because he hadn't been home for three of his visits. Now this man also is tied to a dialysis machine, dialysis machine three times a week too and he's had a stroke and he's got gait problems um, and irretractable pain and, and he had lots of other issues um, that actually were a real problem for him. Um, and I did encourage the <coughs> consultant to put him back on and we'll help you um, um, uh, get to um, the couple. And Doreen and Susie went out to um, visit the couple at home and talk to them about what an ACAT assessment was. and. The reason why he hadn't um, been at home is he didn't have a cat. When when the person actually asked them, you know, can I come out and do an ACAT assessment? So when he responded, he said, well, I didn't worry because I didn't have a cat. Um, so there's lots of issues like that where we make assumptions that people know these things. And in fact, um, uh, to him, it was the word cat meant a cat, you know, not an aged care assessment. You know. So it's all about jargon we're using and people, you know, people don't, won't understand or may not understand. Yeah. So we've got to be careful what language we're using. Yeah. So when it came to um, Dorian and Susie immediately provided some uh, taxi vouchers for him to get to Nephro, to get to his um, dialysis unit because he was leaving at 7 o'clock at night with his partner having to leave the kids at home and catch a bus to get him to get to him at seven o'clock at night because he couldn't catch the bus on his own, leave the kids at home and get him home. So it was his partner who rang up in desperation, you know, you've got to do something. So a lot of our calls, because we've made the connection and Dorian and Susie have developed the rapport, we get about every issue now. Which we can't we can't actually ignore because they are priorities for the community and we don't want to let them down. So although it wasn't our core business, it became imperative, an imperative for us to actually put in place the ACAT assessment um, for this, this person. And Susie went out at the, 
to assist with the, all I needed to do was ring the dialysis unit and I found the gentleman and told him what it was about and he was there for the next day. So the assessment took place and this man now has his transport needs, um, his financial support, he's got uh, equipment and, and resources in his home to help him with his mobility, he's doing some re rehabilitation for his um, um, uh, um, mobility problems and he was a person who had a stroke that didn't have any rehab after his, his stroke. Um, so these sorts of things are what we're finding. So although we're podiatry and diabetes service, we also, um, and we don't want to duplicate any service, we just want to make sure that we change the way services are being delivered to, to Aboriginal people so that they know um, uh, what's in it for them, what they're entitled to, and how can we help them to access the services. So the service delivery model is holistic, um, and it is the podiatry and diabetes that gets the person through the door, but then it's the rest of the family that we link into. So we might have one elderly Aboriginal man, but we're looking after four generations in that family. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All, also, we've got to be flexible. You, know, you have to <coughs> work in a flexible way, and we don't only have booked appointments, so people can just walk in. Anyone can walk in off the street <coughs> at the different clinics, and this is really good. So you know, we just fit them in around what point, appointments we have. One of the difficulties is that we've got um, uh, hard copy records, so we get an appointment list that we're expecting um, and we go off with um, a full client load. Um, they don't turn up, but everyone else does, <laughs> you know, so, um, so we, and we have to be flexible around that too, yeah. yeah. Um, our procurement was um, from a blank piece of paper. When we started the service in um, uh, uh, early 2000, uh, mid-2010, mid we developed the service delivery model, we did the mapping, um, we ordered all the equipments, we set up bases, we ordered the van, um, we, we got all the instruments, we developed our client records. So it was quite a lot in relation to, um, we had six months to set up the actual infrastructure of the program. Then in December we actually recruited our staff and as I said before we had, um, um, the panel actually had um, an amateur health professional and a community member on each of the panel. We started to promote the service widely uh, through our networks, through pamphlets, um, through drop-offs, going and meeting and greeting um, uh, with stakeholders, going to um, staff um, meetings at different tertiary centres to actually um, promote our service and show our faces we are the new kids on the block. And we started the Kelmscott Clinic in um, uh, January um, 2011. Uh, part of the infrastructure was setting up a, a solid evaluation framework for the program as well. In 2011, the team commenced, and it's a small team of two podiatrists, uh, Angela uh, McKenzie and, and Deirdre Beard, um, Doreen Turvey, um, Susie Bonney, uh, admin assistant Michelle Michael and myself as, as the manager. So it's not a big resource, uh, which is why we need to have partners to actually make sure we can ensure that Aboriginal people access the other services they need. We started off with the fixed clinics to begin with um, because we didn't have the van. It took a while to actually get the van from Germany. I think it was frozen over at the time and there was a bit of delay in getting the van over to to Australia. Um, we started with our fixed clinics, we started to develop memorandums of understanding with the divisions to set up the fixed clinics and get, get the equipment actually in place at these sites. Um, and as, as I said, our meet and greets with different service providers around, uh, around the services. And um, the clinics that we started with were Derbal Yarrigan in Maddington, Kelmscott Base, um, the uh, Canning Division Dam in Cannington and down at Manger in the first instance, as they, they had the resources that we could actually link into straight away. And then at the end of 2011, the van arrived and we could commence the van clinics. And just this year in February, we launched the um, the program in partnership with Mudich, uh, with the Mudich Jenna from North and with the other COA programs um, that have been established since 2010. It was actually launched on um, Australia Day the, at the Survival Concert. Yeah. Which is a big gig. So this is our team. Um, uh, Angela is the, um, how do I put it? 
Is this a pointer here? Yeah, this is this. Screen behind you. Oh. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> this is Angela McKenzie, and she's a Scottish podiatrist. You know, um, so we're very lucky to have her. She's got, um, she's a senior podiatrist with a lot of experience looking after Horace foot problems in Scotland, uh, and they're some of the leaders in in um, setting sort of guidelines in relation to podiatry care. And we've got Deirdre Baird. Now she's also a very senior and experienced podiatrist as well. So we're very lucky to have two. Um, uh, senior podiatrists who, who are able to work in this flexible model. We did have a, a bit of an attrition rate with podiatrists in the first year and we've, we've actually been to four rounds of recruitment um, but it, um, hopefully um, we actually will hang on to these two because they're good value. This is Susie Bonney. Uh, she's a Wongai woman from, from Kalgoorlie and she's bubbly and lovely and mm -hmm. fantastic at developing networks and and really solid with her case management. Really good and, at yeah. uh, care coordination. Yeah. yeah. And she's the one who's now doing her graduate certificate in diabetes education as well. This is Michelle Michael and she's a, a frontline person. Yeah. She's, the, she's our face to the program in um, uh, um, Kelmscott. And it is amazing uh, what a difference having an Aboriginal person at the front desk who's actually created a different look around the reception area. It's full of art and photos of different people in the community. Really welcoming and, all yeah. the photos of different yeah. events and you've got the Aboriginal person, our frontline person. It, it, it makes a really big difference yeah. and then we will go up and greet them um, and offer offer them a cup and yeah, there's places to sit, there's things for the kids to do, you know, whether it's a totally. culturally appropriate art as well that they can colour in and mm. yeah, really good. And this is our door, eh? <laughs> uh, and um, there's me, the old one at the side, yeah. <laughs> so, I am, you know, um, I was asked, um, I was at a, a, um, a, a workshop and we all had to stand in a circle um, to actually demonstrate how long we'd been worked in, in the paid health sector. Um, and some had been in two weeks and whatever and they it went around and around and around 30 years, 40, got to me at the end of the line and I'd been in in the health service for 45 years and I thought, oh my God, this is That's right, come around to us, <laughs> yeah, Maureen. <laughs> been there a long time, so a lot of yes. experience. Yes. Yes. Not, not, I mean, I, I guess you could say 45 years of wisdom, I suppose, anyway. <laughs> um, but this is the map of South, South Metro Area Health Service and this is the map of North Metro Area Health Service. Um, and you can see that South Metro Area Health Service, even though we've got about um, mirror populations, we're about, as far as size, we're nearly twice as big. Yeah. And when you look at our most densely, densely populated district for um, South Metro, it's this Bentley area here. And when we did our mapping, that's when we actually found out that um, the, with, dis with hospital discharge data, that the majority of um, admissions for chronic disease uh, in our, from our South Metro Area Health Service were from the Bentley area and likewise they had the highest incidence of amputation. A lot of the older, uh, older generation as well. More, more. Yeah, elderly people. Yeah, yeah, yeah I think that, yeah, that's true. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so when, uh, when we look at our biggest population of Aboriginal people, it's, it's in the um, Armadale area here. Um, then Fremantle, Fremantle's actually got the CBD but then a lot of other um, um, tires as well. Rockingham Quinana is another health district and Pinjarra even though it's actually got the smallest Aboriginal population it's got the biggest tyranny of distance. Yeah. So we, we actually had to make sure we addressed each area actually had a local, had a different need and that's what we've had to accommodate in enrolling the services out. So the, the blue areas um, are, are our mobile clinics um, that we started in 2010. That's with the van. With the van, okay. That's at Verbal Yarrigan uh, in Maddington and at the Otty Centre in South Lake. The yellow is the fix clinics that we started in um, 2010, so that's at um, the uh, Woodwich Court, Kelmscott and the Canning Division. The pink is the clinics that we've actually started um, in 2012. That's at Pavinga Meyer 
at Nephrocare in Spearwood and at Hammy Hill at, at Budio. Yeah. The white dots, um, when we get the capacity, is where we think we also need to actually uh, roll our service out. But we can't duplicate it. We can't actually... We're running at capacity now. We can't spread ourselves There's any only thinner. six of us. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So we're a small team. Yeah. And we especially need more um, male, Aboriginal male health professionals. Yeah. would be good. Yeah, we're lucky that we can refer to um, male health professionals in our Aboriginal team for when our men need extra support because so many of our men have such high needs and they're socially isolated. Um, uh, so we're lucky that we've actually got a, a bigger Aboriginal team that we can refer to for men's activities and men's events and and um, those sorts of things. And they link yeah. into existing men's groups like Mum and Maya at Maya. Yeah, so. they come under um, South Metro, the Aboriginal health team, and there's different programs already in place. Um, one of them, um, which one? The Mum and Maya, Maya up in um, yeah. Armada. Yeah. Yeah. And other different programs, which is really good. We can refer, like, in-house plus externally, yeah, which really works well. So this is, um, promotion is actually an ongoing um, event for us um, and this was just some examples of some of some of the promotional activities. This is at a community event in um, the Armadale area uh, where the van actually arrived and we did foot, foot screenings and foot assessments that day. Can I just say that was Mums and Buffs Day that day? No, this one, was, this, one, this, this one wasn't, one wasn't that yeah. one there? No, this one wasn't. This was that, that one. one. No, this was that that was another one. You've been to so many, Dora, and you don't know oh, which one. Oh, no, I really thought it was, but the importance is, even though it's a Mums and Bubs Day, you know, they want us there because there's all the different um, family members there as well. Um, yeah, but these are some of our, our solid Aboriginal elders too that we actually rely on a lot for cultural support. Yeah. This is um, one of our um, uh, celebrities. He was an Aboriginal man. He's, he actually is, uh, in his house, four generations actually live in one house, Joseph. And when we found him, he actually had, um, he, he'd missed out after an amputation at, at Fremantle Hospital and he'd um, um, had, you know, the salami amputation starting. And when we found him, he had a severe infection and osteomyelitis. So he had to be actually intensively managed and whatever. But he's, he's fine now and he's actually got his boot, special boot made, and he's managing his diabetes well. And his family actually see Pop getting better. Um, and he's even taking an interest in, like he wasn't very, very um, uh, good at remembering his medications and things mm. like that. And I must say, a lot of it is because there's so much confusion around medication. For his particular case, because he'd actually had um, uh, been into hospital, he had medications from a discharge summary that were different to the medications that the GP was holding, that was different when I rang the pharmacist that prescribed it, different to what he prescribed. Mm -hmm. So there was Joseph with all these tablets and he didn't have a clue which one he was supposed to be taking. So he's now on a Webster pack that he's managing quite well. So those are the sorts of things that crop up all the time. You, you'd probably agree with me, Dorian, oh, that do, the, medica do. the medication in the primary health care setting yeah. for people with chronic disease um, is a nightmare. That's what Maureen said, you know, you go into hospital and you get an, another new lot, they're still taking the, the, you know, the medication that was prescribed mm -hmm. and there's so much, okay, we're running out of time here, yeah. but yeah, yeah. Yeah, so, so Joseph's one of good news stories is a good way of actually promoting, going to community events. And um, Turid is our artist, and, and I think one of our biggest um, promotions is driving around in the van that people will rent her art. Yeah. Yeah. And this is our day at Survival Day. So promoting services is really good. Um, so there's been a variety of different methods to, to actually promote the service. Um, uh, as you can see, the Noongar Radio, Good News Stories, community events, stakeholder meetings. Um, we've been in newspapers. Um, the artwork and the exploratory material we have is culturally appropriate. Uh, we've been in newsletters. We've done presentations. The one <laughs> uh, And we've got fantastic um, Noongar networks as well, which is um, uh, the way to go, I think. Um, so what have we done so far? 
Um, we saw 318 new clients in um, uh, 2011 and 1,500 occasions of service. All of our staff have done cultural awareness training uh, a number of times. At that time we'd set up two of our mobile clinics and fixed five of our fixed clinics and we'd attended nine community events. We'd developed partnerships with our meet and greets and Susie had established local networks um, uh, for our services. In 2012, 2012, we actually have already doubled what, or tripled what we what we'd achieved by um, May last year, um, and already our community events are ramping up as well. Um, we've commenced three new sites this year. We're running to full capacity, and just to demonstrate another issue, we we had our first prang in the van. Our guys also have to drive the van fuel it, start the generator, equip it, get it clean, mop, out, mop it out, restock it. So we're, we're multi-skilling all the we're time. We're multi-skilled. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, so we are working differently. So Doreen, um, okay. would you like yeah. to finish? Uh -huh. yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, we've just gone over a time a little bit. Um, okay, yeah, uh, just a few notes to say that... Um, this one. Okay. Um, we're working towards closing that gap on, in, on Aboriginal health, um, not duplicating services. We work in with GPs. Um, yeah, it's, it's a holistic, culturally appropriate service. Um, we're working in with partnerships and um, yeah, making sure how we work is in a culturally um, uh, secure way to benefit um, clients and their families. Um, a lot of that we do through yarning. I'll just take a couple of minutes, sorry. Uh, the most important thing is the yarning. When we meet someone we don't know, we're yarning with them, you know, we're building up that, that rapport um, before you don't even look at your, you know, your, what you have to do, uh, pick up your assessment form. It's sitting down and building that up first, you know, having a yarn, having a cuppa. They'll let you know when they're ready, when they want to move on. <laughs> um, so engaging with the community. Really important, like I was saying before, follow-ups on the clients. Um, no uh, three strikes and you're out. Um, we don't discharge. Uh, we do a lot of advocacy and support, as um, Maureen's mentioned, um, and also linking in with other services. Resources always culturally appropriate. Um, yeah. Um, yeah. Um, that what the difference is for us? Um, it, it's a community. Uh, it's a community-owned um, service. Um, yeah, we're there for the community, so we have to work in there how they want us to work. Um, um, yeah. It works because this is what Aboriginal people wanted. Like I said before, it was from the ground up. This is what they said they want. Um, yeah, and it helps having a um, really good um, Aboriginal health team. Um, working the way we know we should be working and having all the support of everyone in the Moorich dinner team. We all work good together and also having that support um, from the Aboriginal health team and South Metro Public Health. You know, it all goes together.